So, Shona, up you come. Do you think that's enough wandering room? Just over a year ago, Shona sort of flew off to the other end of the world, to Hillsong. Mm -hmm. And she flew back. But she's only here for a short while, so she's going back. How did you find the last year? That's a big question. It's, uh, it's actually funny to like be on stage here because this time last year, so many people were praying for me. And um, they were asking me about my expectations, like what I was thinking about going into this year and what I was expecting. And I'll tell you, everything that I was thinking didn't turn out to what I thought it was going to be. Like this year has been one of the most amazing years. I've had like some very good times. There's been hard times as well. It's not just like a holiday. Some people think I was just on holiday. <laughs> it's actually been incredibly difficult sometimes, like being stripped away from everything. Like I left here at 18. I went over to a new country. I had no friends, no family. I was just like by myself. And you have to create a whole new community like within yourself. And um, that was really easy because the people over there are amazing. And I was part of like a global movement and the people there are just so inviting and they want to help you grow in every way and um yeah i would say that it's been so good that i'm going to go back for a second year if you didn't know that but i'm going to go back because i realized that i actually need to come back to scotland and do some like help here with like youth and young adults and like i really feel like scotland is actually on the map for like a global movement and like things will start to happen but in order to do that i need to go back to australia and really just like develop these skills that need to be done in order for things to change and for things to grow in the country here so yeah <laughs> okay so did you encounter this is not a church question. Did you encounter many um, snakes? None. Uh, spiders? None. But, okay, I can understand the snakes because supposedly all the snakes have been killed off by the spiders. I'm not so sure about, no spiders at all? No, not like okay. bad ones. I'm disappointed. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> So, hope you have a great time. Thank you. Are you wandering around Scotland at the moment? I'll be here till Saturday, till and then Saturday. I'll be back off. Okay, well, mm -hmm. have a wonderful Thank time. Thank you so much. Do come back. Okay. I actually just want to thank everyone who prayed for me and supported me and helped me and encouraged me like throughout this whole year. Like Sometimes you might think it doesn't help, but actually... Like I felt it in Australia, and just thanks to everyone who helped support my family as well. It was, it was an amazing year, and really you guys impacted me a lot in the place I grew up. You know, you guys are like my family, so thank you so much for everything. Okay, so today we begin, <laughs> you're going to like this, a five-week study of the epistle we call First Peter. One week and one preacher for each chapter. Yeah? Enthusiasm. Yes, great stuff. So the downside is that this means we will be positively racing through it. Now, I can quite easily do well over eight hours of sermons on just chapter one. And that's without going into any great depth about it. Because this book, this book of the Bible is chock full of wonderful stuff. Really, wonderful stuff. Great stuff. It, it's, it's brimming with things that we should know. You'll be glad to know that I'm not going to preach for eight hours. That got more enthusiasm than the other thing. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not going to preach for eight hours. Instead, we'll take a half hour break at two o'clock to eat the pizzas I've ordered, and we'll try to be finished by five. Yeah, <laughs> right, as if I could get away with that. 
Margaret would be one of the first, to, first in line to disabuse me of that particularly foolish notion. She'd want me to order more than just pizza. Anyway, moving rapidly on from that traditionally poor attempt at humor, to understand who the Apostle Paul was, we need to understand the man who became, sorry, let's try that again. To understand who the Apostle Peter was, we need to understand the man who became Peter, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon the son of John. Simon was a fisherman, not a scholar, although he was well-versed in the Torah and the rest of what we call the Old Testament. He was uncouth, as fishermen were. He was rough and blunt in his speech, and he was uninspiring. He was one of the 70, the core group of followers of Jesus. He was one of the 12, the disciples of Jesus. And he was one of the three, one of Jesus' closest friends and confidants. Simon was impulsive. <laughs> he jumped out of a perfectly good boat to walk on water, of all things. He was hot-headed. He cut off a man's ear on the night Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was outspoken. Simon called Jesus the Messiah when no, no one else thought to. And he was a coward. Simon denied Jesus three times out of fear. That was Simon. Peter, on the other hand, on the day of Pentecost, after the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter spoke. And 3,000 men, sorry, no one counted the ladies, 3,000 men were inspired to join the number of, people, of Jesus' followers. He was humble. When he healed the lame man at the temple in Acts chapter 3, he gave the glory to God and to Jesus. He didn't ask for it himself. He didn't mention himself. As to the rest, well, that, amongst many other things, is what we're going to learn over the next few weeks. As I said earlier, this letter from Peter is overflowing in yummy goodness, it, particularly chapter one. So much, in fact, that it's not possible to do justice to the whole chapter in the time that I have available. I think I'd be in trouble if I did actually order those pizzas. So today I'm going to concentrate on verses one to 12. First Peter 1, verses 1 to 2. To God's, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. This is the map. Now, Galilee is down here, but at this point, the believers are spread all over the place. Peter is speaking particularly to the guys up in this isthmus peninsula section of the map. He was called to be an apostle to the Jews, although he was the first to preach Christ to the Gentiles. It was Paul who was called to be apostle to us. We are the Gentiles after all. This letter sets out what Peter believes is important for the Jewish believers to know. But really, it's important for all of us. In his book, sorry, first and foremost, the important thing is our faith. More significantly, the sign significance of our faith. In his book, Six Hours, One Friday, published in 1989, Max Locado, you may not have heard of him, probably won't, but he's currently the preacher at Oak Hills Church in San Antonio in Texas. Max 
tells the story of how he and his boat had to get through a hurricane in as few working pieces as possible. And an old sailor advised Max to take his boat out to deep water, drop four anchors, one at each corner of the boat, and pray. Pray that his anchors held. Yes, Max and his boat survived that storm, but he says he learned an important lesson. All of us need an anchor that will hold during the storms of life. That anchor is our faith. Hang on, that sounds like a good couple of uh, lines for a hymn. Hmm. Got to think on that one, sorry. What have you put your faith in? How important is it to have faith? Where do we find faith strong enough to make it through these storms? The storms that come to us through every week, every month, every year of our lives. Well, Peter knows how important faith is, and he gives a great image of faith, a faith that we can anchor deep within, and a faith that will hold us solidly during the storms that life will throw at us. When Peter wrote his letter, things were changing. At the beginning of the first century church, the government, to all intents and purposes, ignored this small, new religious sect. It was just one of many within the region. But as the church grew, the notice and subsequent constrictions of the government grew too. In this letter, Peter is writing to a people who are finding it increasingly difficult to live their faith. Here in the, f the West, we're finding it less easy to be a Christian, which is nothing compared to what our brothers and sisters are going through in the Middle East right now. But we all need to find a way to live our faith without compromise. Peter helps us gain some insight into how to live an authentic, Christ-centered centered faith in the midst of some difficult times. Timeless faith. The question is, do we have faith? Everyone has faith. Atheists have faith that their rational reasoning has removed the possibility of God. They have faith in their intellectual ability. Others have faith in their abilities, skills, connections, friends, family, and themselves. Everyone has faith. The question is, where is your faith anchored? Sooner or later, the storms will begin to blow, and our anchors will be tested. Peter gives us three reasons to anchor our faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ the imperishable. I'm sorry, how is that possible? Well, Look at what that faith in Jesus is, where that faith in Jesus is held. In verse 4, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or faith. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Our inheritance is kept in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy or the thief's, thief steal. I can't remember where that comes from. Didn't look it up. If our faith is based on the things of this world, it wouldn't be good enough. It wouldn't last. Countless kingdoms and empires, commercial and political, have come and gone. Economies have been built and destroyed. We only need to look at the last decade for proof of that. And nations have been established, only be to become nothing more than a footnote in our history. Machu Picchu. Troy. Anchor what? To name just a few. They were forgotten for centuries. Now we know they're there, but they were myth. Only the kingdom of God has remained constant throughout the last two centuries. Sorry, 2,000 years. A bit more than two centuries, don't you think? So the only way our faith can be imperishable is for it to be set in heaven, not in the things of this world. 
our faith will be uncorrupted. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's something of a familiar phrase, which is borne out by the events of history, unfortunately. Do you think that even people like Adolf Hitler or Robert Mugabe set out to be the cause of so much suffering? History is full of leaders who started off with the best of intentions, but ego, pride, and other flaws got in the way. If we put all of our faith in a leader, or even in ourselves, it's just a matter of time before the results of our human, corruptible nature will be revealed. But Christ has no sin, and our faith is in the power of God. God has ultimate power, but it is uncorrupted. There's no ego or pride in the power of Christ. In the whole of eternity, he's the only person who has absolute power, but who has not been corrupted, even a little by it. Our faith can only be incorruptible when it is placed in Jesus. Our faith in Christ is unfading. I know lots of people who are fad people. In fact, I'm one of them. Not that you'd notice. They jump on the latest trend, idea, or perhaps even the latest gadget. Oh yeah, guilty with that one. And a short time down the line, they move on to something else. You want a great example? Get out your old photos, check the hairstyles you used to have, or the clothes you used to wear, and compare them to what you have today. I don't have an image to illustrate this, let me just say fame, and leave it at that. <coughs> yeah, I had a perm. <coughs> Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the faith we have in him will see us through to the end of days. Okay, tested faith. Our faith needs to be anchored in the timeless nature of Christ. But I can hear a few questions. How do you know the faith, that faith in Christ will hold up to the storms of life? Never mind what the hymn says. How do you know? Why should I trust in Christ? Because this is no ordinary faith. It is a tested faith. Countless people have placed their, their faith in Christ and found that the anchor holds. Peter survived some incredible storms of life, and he says here, what I found the faith of Christ to be when it's put to the test. Peter found that attested faith is valuable, revealing, and centered on love. It's valuable. According to Peter, our faith is like gold. As our faith is tested, it's like a goldsmith refining gold. As they melt the metal down in a crucible, impurities come to the top, where they're skimmed off, and the metal's allowed to cool. The goldsmith then goes through that process all over again, and again, and again, until there are no impurities to be scraped off. Peter says that when our faith is tested, the impurities in us are revealed and removed. And our faith becomes more valuable. Peter says, while gold is valuable, its value is nothing compared to our faith. A faith in Jesus Christ will carry us through this life and beyond. A faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of God's only Son is far more valuable than just mere gold. It is something eternal, not something that can be destroyed. It's revealing. The goldsmith knew he had pure gold when he could see his reflection in the metal. Our faith should reflect Jesus. 
and reveal him to the world. As we grow in Christ, we learn more about him and his love. And it's only through a life given to Christ that we begin to see him as he really is. The more we see him the, and put our faith in him at the center of our lives, the more we reflect him and the more others will see him in us. It's centered on our love for Christ. Peter talks about how we love Christ, even though we haven't seen him. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us a definition of faith. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The essence of faith is that it doesn't need want our sight or proof. Faith, though, is reality. Just because something isn't seen doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The examples most recently are gravity waves, air, we breathe it, and the Higgs boson particle. Now, there's a, a thing out of left field. Peter says that real faith is loving a Christ you have never seen but still know exists. The third thing that Peter says is true faith. So often these days, we hear the statement that, well, what works for you may not work for me. Peter had a faith in Christ that was timeless. His faith was valuable, revealing, and full of love. Great. What, what does that mean? How does that mean that what worked for Peter will work for me? Well, <laughs> almost as if Peter had anticipated that question, he writes about the faith of others. It goes back to the prophets of the Old Testament. They found their faith in God to be solid. God gave them a hope that the Messiah, the one who could deliver them, was on the way. Their message can be summed up as, hang on, God's working, the Messiah is coming, just get ready for your deliverer to arrive. This message of hope and encouragement, this promise has been, fu been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And if the promises God gave to those prophets have been fulfilled, you can have faith that his promises to you will be too. There's an astonishing thing about Christianity. It's the only religion that cannot reinvent itself. All other religions in the world are based on a philosophy. They've been created out of the human mind. If all religions were wiped from the face of the earth, someone could happily come along, have the same ideas and thoughts, and recreate them. Except Christianity. Our faith is built on the prophecies of the Old Testament. Prophecies which said, a Messiah is coming. Our faith is built on Jesus. We believe he is the Messiah, the embodiment of the Old Testament prophecies. We believe he died on a cross for our sins and that he rose again. We believe he's coming back. If all reference to Christianity was destroyed, wiped off the map, there is no way it could be recreated as a philosophy. Why? because it's built on a historical fact. The fact that Jesus, whom we believe is God's only son, died on a Roman cross in Jerusalem, on a hill called Golgotha, on Friday the 3rd of April, AD 33 in our calendar. However, our faith has stood the test of time, has proven faithful when tested, and is the only true faith which holds in the storms of life. Peter goes on to say that the faith of the Old Testament and the Gospels is for these present days. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the Gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Can you imagine what that must be look like? 
Angels have seen what God did with the prophets. They saw how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies with his birth, life, death, and resurrection. They have seen Lucifer kicked out of heaven, the resurrection of Christ, the dead raised, the Red Sea parted, and demons exorcised. But what they want to see, what they long to see, is what God is going to do next. They're watching you and me, and they're waiting to see what's coming next. How will our faith and God's great actions meet? As Mordecai said to Esther in Esther 4.14, and who knows that you have come to your position for such a time as this. Our time to live our faith is now.